Uh, it's Gadget UK here again, back for part 7 of the BBC Repair here. Uh, you'll spot it on uh, part 3, I uh, had the title there as part 4, <laughs> just to confuse people. I've got no doubt people are going to be wondering what happened to part 3, or some people will. Uh, surprisingly, nobody spotted it actually until I uh, mentioned it. I think Smooth MJ spotted it and Stu Roro, but uh, yeah, <laughs> for the most part, no one noticed it was, uh, there was no part 3. So yeah, this is part 4. I'll show you the progress I made with the case. Uh, it's pretty good actually. I mean, it's not as good as I would have liked it, but it was never going to be as good as I would have liked it really. In my mind's eye, it was always going to look better than it does, but actually it's pretty well, I mean, good actually. I'm pretty pleased with how it's turned out. Uh, the keyboard's a bit dusty here. It's got a few cat hairs and things like that. I need to uh, finish cleaning it up because it's just been sat around in here for a number of weeks without being uh, cleaned and stuff, you know, so, you know, dust and hairs and things settle. With the weather in the UK at the moment being incredibly hot, heat obviously will kill these things. Uh, and one of the things I've noticed while I've been testing is that sometimes when the lid's on like this, you know, use it for 20 minutes, take the lid off, just touch one of the chips, any of the chips, and they're all absolutely ludicrously hot, even with heat sinks. Uh, so I'm going to fit some fans in here, so we'll show you that a little bit later on. I'll show you the uh, Turbo or Super, as mine is, a Super MMC. It's kind of like a floppy emulator. Well, it will emulate floppies. You know, you stick uh, .ssd or uh, those single-sided disks on in the double-sided disks, I think. Um, yeah, you can stick those on a little SD card and you can run your software from an SD card. So that's what I've been uh, using here to test this. And I've not had any issues using that. Every uh, game or program I've run has just worked fine, actually, and it's pretty blooming quick. So we'll take a look at that. And I'm also going to make the audio switchable so that we can toggle between the internal speaker and the line out. Because it'd just be nice to, you know, occasionally I think, oh, it'd be nice to listen to the speaker actually, you know, when the wife's not here. So we'll switch the speaker back on. So we'll find a way to do that. I've ordered uh, replacement speech chips now. I did receive some speech chips. I'll cover those in the next video. Um, there's some issues with them, so I need to work out where the fault is. Is it in the ROM side of things or is it in the actual speech chip itself? Something else worth covering here is Tricky's test ROM. So Tricky is a developer of the test ROM. Uh, now he's developed a number of things for the BBC actually. Um, some really good homebrew games actually. Astro Blaster, uh, Phoenix, um, I think he's done Frogger and a number of others. Uh, Circus is it called? I think he did as well. Um, yeah, anyway, there's some really good, and Space Invaders. Some really good games that uh, he's uh, been involved with. Um, but he produced the test ROM. Now I thought, let's give this a go. Now we've got it at this stage, I'd like to test the memory. So I'll put this in now, I'll show you what's happening, because it's rather interesting. And I spent a while actually going round in circles, chasing my own tail for most of uh, last week, actually. So we'll just pull out the OS ROM. Just put it on top of the power supply, it's grounded on there, so it should be all right. Um, connects up this EEPROM. Switch it on. Now this has driven me nuts, do you see that? It's like some corruptions, and then we get these bands with dots. Now I thought these little dots indicated a RAM fault. Um, and I was trying to seek some advice there on the um, Stardot uh, forums. People would give me all sorts of advice and stuff, you know, about what might be causing it. Um, I eventually tried a software RAM tester, which I'll show you in a minute, that somebody else wrote, I think it's version 3. Um, and that worked okay. It said your system's fine, you've got no RAM faults. So I tested it in every single mode because you can test that RAM software, the floppy version there, in uh, different modes, you know. Um, and it worked fine. But as you can see, and then it does this where it clicks on and off and the LEDs go on and off, and it just acts really strange. But if I take that out and I put another chip in there, now this chip is an Atmel uh, 27C512R, so it's an OTP chip, 45 nanoseconds. Now it could be a fake, because there are a lot of those that are being faked at the moment actually, I've had a number of them in the past. So I'll switch it on again with that diagram. Look at that, it's totally different, completely different there. So that's normal behaviour, as far as I can understand, that would indicate there are no faults. So if we just keep, leave that going around, we get uh, regular patterns of the lines down here and the, you know, the changes, it goes through the different uh, tests there. But that test just keeps going on for quite a while. You can leave it going for five, ten minutes and it just loops around and stuff. But I think the behaviour there is normal. So that would suggest that all my RAM's okay. I don't have a secondary RAM issue with this to worry about. Because it's all very well testing one or two games, but you know, if you don't um, utilise all the RAM there, 
you don't really know. You know, you could have a couple of bad blocks somewhere, a couple of bad bites or sort of bits or something on certain chips. Although more often than not, when a chip fails, you usually get a problem with a particular bit on that chip. You know, it just fails completely. Uh, but I have seen chips myself where one specific address or a few addresses within one chip are glitchy. Uh, but in this case, yeah, this is now indicated. Let's like, say I've not got a problem. But I do know this chip is okay. I mean, it's, is it too slow? It's, da it's marked dash 10 there. Um, bear in mind the Beeb's going to be accessing these at 2 megahertz, I think, for the most part. So, yeah, th th there is a question as to what's wrong. And I'm guessing it's the speed of this. Maybe the slew or whatever, you know, the, 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 the maybe the data bus is not uh, being disabled quick enough when the output enables uh, turned off, you know, so it shouldn't be outputting and it still is for... A, a cycle or something or half a cycle just it long enough to maybe cause some sort of bus conflict that's what I'm thinking um, because if I put this in my EEPROM programmer I can dump it and you know check the contents against the original ROM and it matches perfectly I can you know do a CRC check on it and it matches perfectly but within the system it just doesn't it does exactly what you've just seen no matter what so I find that quite interesting actually uh, but following that it then led me to think, I wonder if those Rockwell CPUs I've got are fakes as well. Now you remember, I think it was part one, I said that it killed my Rockwell 6502A and uh, I had that chip just sat on the side ready to do some tests on it at some point to work out how it had failed, what had gone wrong with it. I think it was outputting all highs or something, it was acting very strangely. Uh, but anyway, I had that on, my, on the side there to test and yesterday I connected it up to the VIC-20 and it worked perfectly. I had another one that I just tested the day before in the BBC and that wouldn't work either so I had two of those Rockwell 6502As and I tested that in the VIC-20 and that worked fine as well. You know, putting it on test there for a good hour, no issues at all, rock solid. So I would conclude from that that some of the 6502As on eBay, Rockwells in particular, they're not As, they've been remarked, it's a 6502 designed to run around 1 megahertz and as soon as you run at 2 megahertz if you're lucky it'll work but with the warm weather here this is the factor with the warm weather you're not only just overclocking it but you've got the additional ambient heat as well and that's why those two Rockwells were not working in the Beeb there's nothing wrong with the chips they have been re-labeled you know rebadged to say there are 6502A when they're not there are 6502 and they might not even be the same type you know might be NMOS or something I haven't got a clue what they're actually what's actually there and I guess you probably need to do tests in terms of opcodes and things to work out which revision it is. Is it exactly the one that you would work within your system or not? So just bear in mind, if you buy cheap chips from eBay, a lot of them have been rebadged. So whilst I've been testing, just occasionally, very rarely, I've had a problem with a D key. I'd tap it and it wouldn't register, and then I'd tap it a few times and then it'd be okay. Could be a problem with the via, I'm not sure at this stage. Um, but you can see the way you get these out is to just desolder the two contacts from underneath um, and then on this side here can you see these little clips what you've got to do is push these little clips down but at the same time put some pressure on these pins I just put the screwdriver here put some pressure on there while I have the screwdriver on the other side to push one of these down and it comes up on one side so yeah you can get them off um, I mean I'll clean around there with the cotton bud because obviously the underneath of where that is is a little bit dirty um, but I'm just going to soak this in some contact cleaner or some IPA or something just for a period of time because you can see you know the non-serviceable you might be able to prise one of these apart here prise the bottom off but yeah I think it's asking for trouble actually uh, but we can certainly get contact cleaner in I mean I could have done that in situ but the contact cleaner is going to go everywhere then uh, at least doing it this way uh, I can get some contact cleaner and test, test it out of circuit see how reliable it is actually with the contacts there so it's been cleaned up and we just need to just carefully push it in. Um, there we go. You can see it just clips back in again. Uh, and then the points are here to solder. What I would suggest you do is uh, press it down from the other side while you solder just to make sure it's as flush as possible. So we'll just clean up with the uh, cotton bud around there now just to get rid of that uh, flux. The main thing is at least I've ruled it out. I mean, I'm not actually sure whether that switch was the cause. Because like I say it could be via... I'm not sure whether I've got um, a bit of a glitchy via here because I have had the, just the odd little bit of unusual behaviour still which uh, does lead me to wonder what else is not quite right and the vias are certainly uh, in the realms of uh, possibility there actually. So I also wanted to have a way to split the uh, or switch between the internal speaker and the line out. 
it would just be nice, you know, occasionally when my wife's on holiday or something uh, to be able to enable a speaker. So in order to do that, I'll perhaps stick a video in a video up here. I worked on uh, initially a little uh, piece of breadboard with a relay. The idea being that at some later date I would modify it to uh, use maybe monitor, connect to the picture, but monitor the keyboard with a certain key combination, you know, have it automatically switch over. But I just decided I didn't like the idea of having a relay in there. Um, I was going to use a reed switch initially with it, you know, with a magnet underneath just to switch off and on. And then it just suddenly dawned on me, it's just far easier just to have a physical switch. So you can see the grey wire coming off here, just going out through the cavity there, goes underneath the switch. I'll show you my heat shrinking that in a sec. Um, but all I've done is just take a pin header here, you know, a socket, uh, and everything's encapsulated with heat shrink, you know, that's got heat shrink, there's heat shrink there to join two wires, uh, and these here just connect, you know, to the uh, connectors there. Uh, and I've just marked these up with a little bit of white uh, acrylic uh, paint actually on the sides there, uh, a little dot on the board, just so I can get the ground, you know, the right way around. Uh, because that would be super easy to do actually, you know, you might not think it's important, but when you get the ground and the plus the wrong way around on a speaker, the dome is inverted, it moves the opposite way. Uh, so you kind of get, with stereo speakers, it can be a big problem. If you've got one speaker the wrong way around and one speaker the right way around, you get what's called phase inversion, where one speaker cancels out the other one, uh, and it can sound sort of odd. Um, yeah, you'll know what I mean if you're used to dealing with uh, stereo systems and things like that. Um, so, you know, the way this works to start with with the BP, you could put that either way. It could be super easy to get that around the wrong way, so it's beneficial anyway if you're just going to keep your speaker and just have a speaker. Black wants to go to the nearest ground. If you measure from grounds on there, test continuity to uh, the points on the jump here, one of them is ground. So, yeah, that's why I've marked them up, just to make sure I don't get them inverted. Um, and it just means now, like I say, that I've got the best of both worlds. So there's our switch soldered on and heat shrunk. What I'll do next is get a piece of heat shrink tubing over there. As you can see, I've uh, shrunk some heat shrink over the neck there. I mean, there's a little gap there. You could always cover that over with something else. Uh, but that should mean now that I can just have that floating around in the bay there and uh, it's not going to cause any problems. And as you can hear, I can easily switch over now. It can fit flat just under there because of the rubber feet, you know, so or you could stream it out the side so you've got easy access, but personally I don't want my cats chewing it, so it can just stay uh, bundled up under there like that. Yeah, so these are held down with like uh, like a thick um, double-sided pad, it's, you know, pretty sturdy stuff. You could pretty much hang this upside down and bang and bang and bang the bottom and the fans wouldn't come off. Um, but you can, you know, they can, with a little bit of force, you can wobble them around there. Um, so, yeah, it's not ideal. What would be ideal is to 3D print something, um, a little mould that you could perhaps, you know, fit around the chips or something, you know, points on the corners, just to help hold that in place. Someone might be able to do something like that at some point for one of these, I don't know. But you can see the approach I've gone with here, and I've got various fan sizes. I've got a couple of these larger ones, I've got a couple of the smaller ones. Ideally, what I wanted to do was have a large fan flowing one way and a large fan uh, and a large fan on this side flowing the other but there's just nowhere to fit it you know this is the best I could come up with here to trim the corner off this little fan here and it just fits there you can see there's a resistor just down there that's where to tr trim the corner post off it but it just fits nicely in that space there and I've got that one blowing uh, this way sucking away from the heat sink here because that chip gets super hot more than the others although this one gets pretty blooming hot as well actually the uh, 6845 here, you know, the graphics chip. This fan is blown that way. Now, you may think that we're not going to get air circulation, but actually we are, and it works super, super, super well, better than I could have possibly imagined, actually. Um, it was pretty hot in here yesterday, and after I got these set up like this, I put the lid on, switched it on, left it running for a good 30 minutes or so, took the lid off, felt the chips, they were stone cold. I couldn't believe the difference, it's like night and day. So this is where the tissue comes in. If I hold a piece of tissue here when it's on, you can see visibly the piece of tissue gets sucked to this area here. And if you move over this side here, it just starts to flicker away a little bit from there. So it is actually working. Uh, an ideal situation would be to have two fans the same size though, because you obviously can have more flow this way, less flow that way. But it is actually working and it's working super well. 
So it's worth covering how, how I did this. I took the power supply to pieces. I followed uh, from the auxiliary connector underneath to see where the 12 volts connects to. And it goes to the, on mine, it goes to the yellow wire on the auxiliary connector. So I've just uh, tapped into that yellow wire there and uh, put this little connector here, as you can see. And you've got male and female connectors there, and I've switched them around so you can't mix them up with any of the other connectors. And actually, the distance wouldn't allow to anyway. You know, there's, that's the 5 volt connection there via resistor to the LED. You know, that's not long enough to go anywhere. So I've used a you know, different orientation there just to protect against that as well. But yeah, the 12 volts uh, comes out of the power supply here, and it's detachable. This is the thing. So we'll detach it to start with. We'll run it so it's uh, you know, without it. Stick the lid back on. I'll time it for a f fixed period of operation, running a, a game or a demo or something. And then we'll uh, switch it off. I'll go around and I'll check the temperatures. I'll perhaps check the temperatures before we start here just to get sort of ambient as it is now. Um, and then we'll let it cool down again. I'll wait until I've got approximately the same ambient temperatures again once it's cooled down. We'll connect up the fans, I'll run it for the same amount of time, and we'll do the same checks again. Bear in mind it's getting a bit warmer in here as the day goes on. Um, so you would expect, you know, with the fans, you know, we're going to have a harder time, basically. You know, 20 minutes from now it's going to be a few degrees hotter in here, I'm sure. Um, so it will be a fairly uh, good test to do. Um, but I, I know the results straight away. I'm going to be amazed if these are not 20 plus, maybe even 30 degrees cooler with the fans versus without them. Because I felt the difference myself. Uh, just at 20 minutes yesterday, it was so hot you couldn't even touch them. You would touch them and you would burn yourself on pretty much any of them. But with the fans, you don't get that at all. You can touch them and they're pretty cold. So I'll disconnect the fans. I mean, I run a risk running it without the fans, actually. That is one concern I do have. So I'm only going to do this for maybe five or ten minutes I think and um, we'll power it on apologies huge light glare but what we'll do we'll load the menu there and we'll just leave it with an Arcadians because that's got a demo mode that just goes round and round and round once we start the game so I'm going to time now for about ten minutes I think so we're approaching the five minute mark, I think we'll just uh, take some readings now just to see how it's going and then I'll either go for another five minutes, so I'll just uh, point you down. Yeah, so as you can see, just past five minutes, we'll just uh, take the lid off, bear in mind that's going to contain a lot of the heat, but we'll do the same thing when I do it the other way around. Yeah, just going around now, can you see that? We had 50 degrees there, 52 degrees, see that 55 there. Yeah, we got about 50, 55, 56, 57 degrees there. Um, and a lot of the other chips are around 35 to 40 degrees at this stage, so we'll put the lid back on. So as you can see, we've just passed uh, 19 and a half minutes, so we'll whip the lid off and have a quick measure around. And bear in mind, it's not as hot in here at the moment as it was yesterday when I was doing testing. Um, but it's, it's hotter than it was uh, 20 minutes ago, that's for sure. So we're pretty much at the 20 minute mark. Uh, and if I move the probe around can you see that there you go look at that 60 61 degrees on the video ULA there so let's have a hover around I'm guessing around 40 seems to be like an ambient on a lot of these chips actually let's see if we can go around the CPU here 49 on the CPU there let's just have a test of some of these yeah that's incredibly hard burns yeah I mean the video ULA is a good example you know 62 degrees 60 degrees there around that area 50s around other areas of the board there that's the um, teletext generator 50 degrees yeah I got 53 there on that so we're looking at uh, between 45 and 50 on most of the chips on here 53 degrees on here over 60 on this out yeah so I think what we'll do now is connect the fans and then uh, I'm not even gonna let it cool down I just guarantee it'll just cool down on its own with the fans there so I'll connect the fans up uh, switch the lid back on and we'll again just leave it going for another 20 minutes and I'll just report back at regular intervals there we go fans engaged so let's just uh, temporarily put the lid on so we've got airflow in on this side where it's uh, sucking it look at that as you get near the edge there it sucks in look at that and on this side uh, it's blown out so we've not got vast amounts of airflow there uh, I could you know with larger fans you'd get more airflow and if there wasn't the ridges on the inside would have even more airflow but I guarantee that's going to be an awful lot cooler now so we're approaching the five minute mark uh, with the fans on so let's uh, I'll just wait till it gets to exactly five minutes and then we'll just pull the lid off just like we did before and just see what's happened 
Now bear in mind it was running really hot as it was, we haven't started from idle here. So I had to move the camera up a bit there so you could see it. It's dropped by 10 degrees or more already, 40 degrees there around the video ULA. It's only been running 5 minutes. Um, this was 50 degrees before, down to 36. And to touch, there's a huge difference. You, c you couldn't touch these before, they feel just l hardly lukewarm. So I think this, this gauge here is not accurate. I would suggest that there's 20 degree difference easily. It's noticeable. This was actually red hot before, it's not even lukewarm now. The difference uh, is like night and day. I really should get a multimeter with a thermocouple to measure, you know, to do some really accurate readings because what you want to do really is make, as I say, stick the thermocouple under these chips one by one and check them that way but there is a significant difference, let's leave that for another 15 minutes so we're approaching the 10 minute mark, we'll check again 35 video ULA 40 I mean that is 20 degrees less than it was most things are 30, 35 degrees 34 in fact we've got, yeah, so we've got less than 40 now on the video ULA, 38 degrees, it's down from like six, just over 60. And that's with the lid on, starting from hot, you know, not starting from cold, it's going down. Yeah, yeah, so after 20 minutes as you can see, around 37, 38 degrees, so it hasn't changed much from the about 15 minute mark actually, 35 there on the CPU, 35 on the uh, chip at the back there, it was 50 before. That was super hot before, like I say, you couldn't even touch it, it's just lukewarm now. Again, 35, 36 degrees, 33, um, but in general, but in general we're seeing a huge difference, you know, 37 degrees there versus just over 60, we were approaching 62 degrees before, it makes a massive difference. And someone's bound to say, you know, these things run alright without the fans, yeah, and that's true, alright, yeah, hot, hot weather today, you know, this week, this month, is an extreme condition here in the UK, we don't generally get weather this hot, but in general these things will always run cooler with fans and with heat sinks. A friend of mine's got a PhD in materials, metallurgy, you know, he's specialised in metal, metallurgy, um, so he's got first hand experience of understanding how semiconductors and um, metals in general are affected by temperature. Um, and it's no surprise, you know, what, what, many, many years ago he was talking to me about this sort of stuff um, and explaining exactly how it works and their relationship to um, entropy. Uh, you know, that all things try to go into a disordered state, you know. If you imagine, you know, every person on the planet just disappeared now, come back in 10,000 years or 100,000 years, most things would have just disintegrated into dust, you know, buildings would have crumbled, brick would break down into particles through wind and erosion and you know heat heat is a huge factor um, so it's no diff it's no different with something like this you know these chips you know I get a lot of people squawking on my videos when I stick heat sinks and fans and things on saying well they were never specced by a Commodore or whoever to have a fan or a heat sink you know that particular chip so why would it need one uh, and that's kind of just ignorance really um, it really is that simple putting it bluntly if you want to extend the life of something like this you know your voltages are important. You want you know you, you don't want to over voltage things, but heat is a factor as well. Um, you've got to remember that when the BBC, you know, when Acorn were uh, designing a system like this, well, they were not designing it to be cool in such a way that it would last you know 30, 40, 50 years or more. It was designed to function for maybe several years, maybe three or four years. You know they would factor in you know just repairs you know people would take them in for a repair if something failed because it had overheated you know from prolonged use you know video ULA is the early ones are a good example of that with the heat sinks um, they weren't bothered about that you know because they were going to get spares you're going to get repairs they're going to be able to sell new models um, but temperature is an absolute factor in the life of any semiconductor absolutely guaranteed you want it to last longer keep it cooler and of course there's a good argument there to suggest that the power supply is your biggest source of heat problems within this system really, you know, just feeling the top of that there, it's absolutely red hot, it's incredibly hot that. So a fan somewhere within the power supply would be a super good idea. It's just a question of where you fit that, you know, this, you know if you've got smaller caps like I have down in this section here, there may be room to fit something like that within here, facing one way or the other to either suck air in through this way or out, it's just a question of how it gets then out, you know there are some 
vents underneath you know you could maybe fit a small fan on the underside there somehow you might need to modify the case I don't know um, but that's something worth considering but the power supplies tend to be very reliable actually on these other than the, the caps that you saw in the earlier videos there um, they tend to be pretty reliable power supplies so apart from the earlier ones, and I mentioned that briefly, briefly in the last video with an annotation, the earlier ones in the BBC they had uh, the original versions of the BBC didn't have a switch mode power supply. It was linear with lots of regulators and stuff on there, and that used to heat, and it was a source of problems actually in the early models of the BBC. It was a chap who used to work at Acorn who designed the BBC and worked on you know, development and design of the, the different models and things there. I forget who it was, I'll try and post a link down below if I can uh, remember who it was. But uh, he uh, clearly explained that the BBC didn't want switch mode power supplies because of the noise that they feared would be generated by a switch mode power supply. Now the BBC being a broadcasting corporation, you know, BBC TV, they didn't want interference from switch these modern, you know, fangled things, you know, called switch mode power supplies. Uh, but Acorn convinced them that they could make it in such a way that you know it wouldn't generate lots of noise and it wouldn't interfere with their broadcasting equipment um, and that was why we then ended up um, with uh, the switch mode power supply coming in fairly soon after like I said these things were created really. So we do at DIN 400 I think is one this should be one of my own and you can tap back out to catalog the disc so it's just like you've got a floppy in there you can see that one's a pod so let's load that I mentioned that in a previous video it might have been in part one I can't remember and we can just uh, load it just as normal. Now we've got that disc selected. We can just hold down shift, keep shift, hold down, press break, and lo and behold, pod's loaded. So you might say that was one of my own uh, disc images. Press space, uh, what do you want to do? Find out the action pod knows one. Got this brain back a lot of memories. Now the funny thing is, I was looking at this earlier, I remember when I played this, well, I played it, used it, you know, it's an educational piece of software here. I was about, uh, I don't know, eight, seven or eight at the time, um, and we had a small, you might remember, a Cub Micro Vitec monitor, you know, it was a really small thing, it was like, I don't know, 12 inches or less, um, so a pod looked a lot smaller and a lot more detailed, I was horrified at how giant it is actually, uh, and the idea with this was, like I said, being an educational title, you would say, uh, I don't know, pod can fly, and then pod, if you could do that, if that was one of his vocabulary, um, that, you know, all the actions he had in his uh, vocabulary there, he would do it. So yeah, it was a really interesting educational title for a seven-year-old at the time. Um, let's try something else. No, apparently uh, Pod needs some fibre in his diet. And a couple of additional points here from when I went in the power supply. You can see him sticking the cable ties on. Um, you need to do it so that the thing here, you know, see the little grip, is on the inside of the power supply so that uh, that does not catch on things, you know, and we'll just tighten that up now. And the other thing we're going to do, and I don't think you spotted, see this cap here, it's super close to that resistor underneath. It's been pushed forward at some point, so we're just going to bend that out like that, away, and just make sure it's not near anything, uh, and it's not, it's not near any of the components there. And as you can see from the video where I was messing around with the NV RAM, um, I've labelled up all these so it's clear as to which chip they go to and which pin. Um, it's recommended doing something like that because you know the last thing you want when you've got a load of mods and things like this in a system is one of them coming unclipped when you're trying to do something and going, oh no, where was that clipped on? And then having to go start like researching the uh, you know your, the mods and things you've done previously, try and work out what goes where. So in the previous video there, someone suggested uh, perhaps using a 74HCT02. That would be ideally suited. Uh, I believe, now I could be wrong, I think the HC indicates it's got CMOS inputs and TTL outputs. Could be wrong. Um, but yeah, a 74HCT02, I tried that, and that does actually work. If I remove this chip, put a 74HCT02, I get the benefits of not having the, the jumping up and down like I was getting in Arc, uh, not Arcanoid, what's it called, Arcadians and various other things. Well, all, all software, really, all games. Um, so it solves that stability issue, and I don't get the colour band that we had down the left-hand side in composite mode. But would I really want to leave that in there? I don't think so, because there are two other gates in that chip that we used elsewhere, you know, and whilst we can't see any issues there, there could be, could, timing wise, it could be affecting clocks and all sorts of things. Um, but the 74 HCT was, was also perhaps the better chip to use when you do the piggyback model like this, you know, rather than having a HC02 on the top just for that one gate, stick a HCT 
O2 on there for that one gate because that TTL output on that one gate um, going to the XOR gate I think which is you know the final stage there for producing the C-Sync signal is going to be happier if you like having that TTL input there as it is now that's the only question with this on the on the output stage through the XOR gate there the input is going to be coming from uh, you know the CMOS gate here now it's not causing me any issues so I suspect it will be okay no matter which what you do but HCT O2 will work there oh, and whilst we're in this area the other thing I'll point out and I, I sort of briefly mentioned it with annotations and things but you know I've ruled out the 6845 that was swapped out so that was not the cause of the issue with the V-Sync and H-Sync there uh, you know, well, the C-Sync ultimately. Um, so it's definitely not the 6845. I did later try sticking a, a bypass cap on the uh, across the supply. So the 6845 that made no difference. Uh, and a few people were pointing out about the sync. You know, the you know, in fact, I was only just above 300 millivolts. I think it's more common to be around one volt. Someone mentioned one to two volts. That might be um, okay. But, uh, you know, I'd started around just over a volt, and I went down, 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 different resistor sizes. The problem remained no matter what, and I got right down to just above 300 millivolts. I think I measured on the scope at 330, and the issue was still the same. It wasn't any better, it wasn't any worse, um, exactly the same, and it was only at this point when we identified that, uh, you know, that problem there with uh, the chip, you know, as soon as I changed that to CMOS, that gate, it solved the problem, and it has solved the problem. I haven't had any jumping around or anything. So yeah, hopefully that's put that to bed. So we've got this powered up with everything in it. You can see speech chips there. That'll be a future video, hopefully next week. Uh, we've got the MV RAM chip you saw in the previous video. We've got the Boobip uh, EE PROM and the 64K RAM, sorry, 32K RAM ROM board. Um, and the fans, but the fans are running on the 12 volts, uh, which comes through this connect here, which I showed earlier, that just goes straight into the power supply. Um, so I thought what we'll do is we'll just measure uh, the voltages here. So the other thing I'd point out here is in a lot of these, the keyboards have been in and out, in and out, in and out, as people have dealt with ROMs and things, swapped ROMs over, or other mods. Uh, and the pins there can be higgledy-piggledy. Mine were like all over the place. I had one like that, one like that, one like that. You know, they sort of all over the place. They were really badly mangled. So I spent some time with fine nose players there, straightening them all out a number of times, actually. Uh, and then the other thing I would say is when you want to disconnect the keyboard, don't just pull it down while it's still connected to get access to your ROMs unplug it where it is and just lift the keyboard out of place because the the single strand you know if you look at the wire here there's a single strand of like copper there might be more than one strand but it's like it looks like a single strand it's really stiff this um, and the more times you bend it forwards and backwards like that you will break the connections um, and you'll break you know you'll damage where it's crimped a, a number of times actually I've had problems like that where I've pulled it out and then tried to put it back and it's just not been very good fitting it's like you just get occasional problems and that was the problem I had with the D. There was nothing wrong with the key. It was a combination of the pins not being quite straight enough and the fact that I pulled this in and out a few times. So yeah, I would suggest that uh, you know you leave that in place and just disconnect it. Um, and there's an argument there to say, depending on which way this is bent, if those have been bent, you know, it, you can have a, a good or a bad connection if there's some torque there. You know, so if the pins, say the pins just fit straight into that now like that, you're at the mercy of oh, off. see if that went straight on like that now with no movement you know no torque on this pressure from one side or the other if your oh, slots are loose and the pins are a bit misaligned you're not going to get a good connection and I have had a bit of that which is why I've had to straighten them and stuff um, but if you you know if this is sort of firmly bent down here and then you connect it on and you've got to pull it out a bit to cl clip on there you've got the pull of the cable to help with the loose socket there one of those has come off it's a good job I leveled them up so uh, anyway yeah I thought I'd just mention that I'll show you what happens now when you've not got a keyboard connected so I've had to pick the camera up to show you this just because the light is so bright and you can't see that single cursor flashing. Can you see a small cursor just flashing there? That's when the keyboard is not connected. So you can see the meter there I think. So I'll just check the plus five and hopefully we're not seeing too much drop. Yeah, that's pretty blooming good actually, 4.98 volts. And we've got a lot of stuff in there. But bear in mind that you know the power supply in the beep, it's not got an infinite supply. You know, there will come a point where you've got too many chips in one of these systems, it's gonna fail or it's gonna struggle, or you're gonna cause it to have a shorter life. There are some of the old school RAM ROM boards that sort of sit over the CPU and stuff and they sort of expand out this way. 
and you have like 14 or 15 sockets there for EEPROMs uh, and it might not be that many, it might be like 12 or so because you've still got a couple of the ones down here as well but one of those, you know, with lots of individual EEPROMs that's going to consume quite a lot of current I would think um, so you know the, the fewer chips you go with uh, the better I'm uh, not following my own advice here, I'm stretching the keyboard out when I shouldn't do but you know something like one of these here that gives you four EEPROM slots that's a good idea I would think Stick two of those in there and you've got, uh, you know, you've gained like an extra six slots, which is pretty good. So when I painted the case there, I did have a load of footage actually, including the mix in the colours. And I've just lost it, I cannot find it at all, I don't know what I've done with it. The only thing I can think I did is forget to take it off the SD card. Thought I'd copied it across and formatted it, so, I mean I haven't lost a lot, but I mixed these colours here. The white, that sienna, green, you wouldn't believe, but there is a hint of green there, and that yellow. And it was just a case of experimenting with amounts of each, you know, mostly white with tiny, tiny little bits of these. And that's why I got the cream. And the cream pretty much was an exact match. It looks the same. On the part of the case where you've not got loads of white underneath, it's the same colour. So it's just the white that kind of makes it look a little bit brighter. And it's just it's the texture as well, because it's got a textured uh, surface, the beeb. And obviously it's hard to replicate that when you're just filling it in and smoothing it down. So I'll give you a quick look at the case from above now, I'll show you the uh, damage that was painted. Uh, now bear in mind, it's never going to be perfect, can you see, you know, you can still see where the fracture was, although it, it is smooth, you know, if I put my hand across this, it's, uh, I can maybe feel a bit of a lip there because that bit piece didn't go in very well, but as you can see, the colour match is pretty good. Now, where the colour doesn't join very well is on the corners, can you see here, it's like, it's a bit, uh, what's the word, it's the white underneath it, it's giving it a kind of a different, it's affecting the colour, it's making it whiter. So what I perhaps should have done, when I'd mixed the paint there, is given this, these corners an extra go. I could always fill that chip in there, but I think you'll agree, that's not bad actually, compared to what it was. I mean, it had a giant gaping hole, there was large pieces missing, and it's a similar thing over here. This is perfectly smooth, it looks like there's a lump there, but there isn't. It's really super smooth there. It's just the, uh, mostly the, the colour, you know, it's not an absolute perfect match there. I think you'll agree, from a distance, it's quite trivial. Uh, I'm pretty pleased with the results. Other people could have definitely done a better job than that. I am not an expert DIY things like this. This is my fudgery attempt to try and do the best with this. Um, you know, and I left that little chip there. I could have just removed that, stuck another piece of black vinyl over there or something, because that does look pretty tidy, that piece there. Um, this is still a bit scratched up in the lights. You know, from here, I can see it looks a bit weird, actually. I've never noticed that till now. But when it's not over bright in here, it doesn't look too bad. I mean, I could always just stick a piece of vinyl over there if that bothered me, but it doesn't, to be honest, and it's a bit of history. So the only other question is, what do we do with this? Do I put this back in place? Um, uh, I'm not sure. It's going to, you know, it uses a slot. Um, incidentally, someone mentioned, yeah, you can still buy these. I know you can. I was trying to show a technique of how to repair something like this. If you can't get one of these, I've got some of these in my drawer that came from Allison's stuff, actually. I think there's two or three of these, the exact same size. Um, Crimping them can be a bit of a pain, but nevertheless, I could swap that out for a brand new one. But I just thought I'd mention that. But yeah, what do I do with this? Well, like I say, I could put this in. Um, am I ever going to use it? I'm not sure. This would go, I think, to the left like that. Because you want, you know, the facility to plug something in. You wouldn't want it that way around. Because you'd be plugging a cart in or something. It'd be interfering with the keyboard. You wouldn't be able to type. Uh, so yeah, that definitely goes to the left. Um, I could just fit it and then just not connect this inside, I'm not sure. The other thing I could do is remove the Super MMC ROM, you know, stick that into one of those uh, slots of the 64K EE PROM, which you've not seen yet, uh, and then, then fit this inside. Maybe get a PCB designed, I don't know, I might do that. I've just ordered some PCBs for a SID for this actually, so that will be an upcoming video as well. Uh, I've not screwed this back together properly yet, but you can also see we've got our nice gold uh, RCA phono audio out on the back, so that line out all the dirt came off. I cleaned up the feet, the underneath came out really clean. Uh, you can see we've got the Turbo MMC there uh, connected here. Then we've got the Raspberry Pi which will be a future video. So I was wondering what to use for label uh, and then it struck me, you know, the BBC is um, synonymous with the educational system in the UK, you know, for the 80s, you know, computing, um, had we not had the BBC, I don't know what we would have had in schools, and would it have had this, you know, would those computers we were using have the same impact that the BBC did? Many people ended up in the IT industry, myself included, because of the BBC. 
it really was that influential. Um, so ad uh, meliora, I can't even say it, I don't think it's Latin, which means towards better things. Uh, and I think that's quite appropriate, especially when you consider not just the impact it's had on individuals, you know, but on the markets and things, on technology in general. You know, Acorn followed up with the uh, ARM uh, processor there in the Archimedes, and the ARM roadmap sort of went through the roof, really. You know, it ended up in, started off in like pocket PC devices and probably other computers and things, but ultimately has ended up as perhaps one of the most successful processors uh, in the world. Um, I checked some Wikipedia earlier and a, it said 100 billion ARM processors were produced as of 2017. 100 billion, that's absolutely crazy. Um, so yeah, I think it's quite fitting uh, towards better things. I th certainly think that fits with the BBC. It certainly has inspired and influenced uh, an awful lot of people. So I do hope you found that interesting. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you soon.